Hi everyone, thanks for this episode of the Medieval Times. On this episode we have a sensational guest, we have the talented Brett Hellings. Brett is from the supergroup Hellings, Hellings supergroup band, which has just recently released their incredible new single titled Kill Me to Keep Loving You, which is available now. Welcome Brett, and thanks for coming on the podcast. Absolutely, thank you Nick for having me. You're really welcome. Um, Tell me, how's it all been going over there? Everything's going really good, man. Uh, America's really great. We just actually got back from um, California. But I was out in the Sunset Strip where I kind of grew up and, and, and played a bunch, uh, cut my teeth on, and uh, just sat there playing the whiskey, uh, which was nice. And uh, we just released uh, Kill Me, Keep Loving You, which is great. A record that has been um, awaited quite a while. We made it back in the COVID era, and uh, it's been a it's been a while to kind of release and get together and do the music video and do all of that. And uh, well, we're really excited. We're getting a really good response from everybody. Nice. And about to record, um, I mean, uh, release another single in February, which is nice. And we're going to continue to release uh, singles uh, from the record that we did back in uh, 2020. So That's sensational. Um, yeah, I was listening to me to keep loving you. I love the song. It's um, wonderful. It's It's well put together. Um, yeah, it's Thank a really good song. Thanks, brother. Yeah. You're all welcome. Yeah, it, it was a, it was a, quite a process to bring it all together, especially playing with some of the best in the world. It was, it was a, the experience of a lifetime, really. Yeah, tell me about that. Um, tell me about the, um, obviously the other musicians that are part of it. It's truly, um, remarkable how, you know, you've got such a super group of people in it. Yeah. It was, uh, it was kind of crazy. It was. It really only happened because of the situation we were in with COVID. Because a lot of the guys were always, you know, those guys are always touring and they're always on tour with the, you know, some of the biggest bands in the world, the Aerosmith, Guns N' Roses, and Al Cooper and stuff like that. But during that time, there was nothing really going on. And I was, I have a relationship with a man named David Davidian, who's Al Cooper's tour manager, and he um, knew I wanted to kind of put a record together. I had a lot of material. I was itching to get into the studio, and he kind of used some of the resources he had and people he met along the way of a tour managing all kinds of different acts. Um, and he put a group together that I thought would really work well together, personality wise, musicianship wise, people that really were just into the music. Um, and that were maybe like tied to a certain brand in full, you know, it, it was like Rich has been part of guns for a long time, but he's always been kind of like the filler in kind of guy, but, it's like, wow, why do, maybe Rich would be interested in something like this. He's played in so many different bands and uh, going to Buck, who's also the songwriter himself and plays in all kinds of different groups. And, and then, of course, some of the best session players like Billy and Kenny, um, he went to all these guys and they, and they gave him some of my demos that I had and some of the stuff I've done and they were very interested in me. And um, they were like, yeah, let's go, let's go down and, and let's bring the best that we've got, you know, best songs that we have, best songs you have, and let's throw it all in together and see what happens in 11 days, you know. Um, we got 11 tracks. It was a little over a week and a half. We got these tracks down, and then I went down to Nashville and did my vocals, and, and there you have it, you know. It was it was something so, just so special, the timing, the people, and how everybody just, the camaraderie between everybody and how everybody was so like-minded. To have something like that... And no one have ever met or had ever been in the same room together. And for that to happen was spectacular. It was remarkable, really, <laughs> if you think about it. Yeah, that's, it's mind blowing. Um, what, what, what is your best memories of it so far? Like, um, the whole process of it? Uh, the best memories I would say is just, uh, getting to know the guys and, and, and having, and creating relationships with them. I didn't know that I was going to, um, still be friends with them to this day and stuff like that when I went down. It was more of like, uh, okay, maybe I'm just get the record done and, and, and get some really great music out of it and, and, and see. And, you know, it was kind of a test for me to play with such elite musicians. So I was pretty nervous and I was, I went down and I, you know, I was like, whoa, how can I keep up or, or can I, am I, do I have the same work ethic as they do and, and all that kind of stuff. But, um, I learned so much for them and they took me in and they taught me so much and, I was just, that's what I've really gained from it. Besides the, the music that we get to now share with people and everything, um, just the, the relationships. And I still keep those relationships to this day. I get to text, you know, these guys what I need of some advice or just a hang or just to call them. And 
I've been doing a lot of interviews with Rich, and I just did with one with Kenny the other day, and so just uh, just these new relationships, and then and with some of the best players in the world, and their stories and their their experience is uh, like it's endless almost, it, and, and someone you would really want to be around as a young, um, um, sort of young, you know, musician trying to figure it all out. Um, I, I think that's what that and the music, you know, are the two things that are invaluable. Yeah, hundred percent. You can definitely pick their brains, you know, to obviously make yourself better as well. You know, it's, it's incredible. Yeah, yeah, it was really, really, and we all did, and it was so cool how humble they are. They, you know, they're the ones that always said, you know, we're never stop learning, too. You know, we are learning in this process. It's with those, it's a never-ending thing. It's music, music for life, and that's the kind of players, people they are. So I felt very at home with that because I've been doing the same thing for half of my life. So. To be with people that have done it like twenty years even more than me was 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 awesome. Yeah, that's that's um amazing. Oh, right, take us back. Um, I believe you started playing guitar at fourteen. Yeah, right around fourteen. Yep, I got my first guitar. Um, she's right over there actually. Uh, oh I, wow! I, yeah, <laughs> like I don't know if you can see her, but yeah, yeah I can see it. I can see it. <laughs> <laughs> because I didn't know what pick cards were at the time so I would just play and play and play so I've written everything on that guitar so she's got she's kind of like Elvis's or Willie Nelson's guitar <laughs> so um but I started right around 14 um I went to my first concert right around that time which was STP I um uh, I was you know my my brother was really into rock and roll I grew up in kind of like a non-denominational Christian family so I never really got to know what rock and roll was my my mom and my dad tried to you know, to keep me away from that kind of world. And um, I I, I kind of got into it and I got my first record from my brother and we went to the concert and saw Scott Weiland. And once I saw Scott Weiland, I was hooked. I was like, oh my goodness, if I could do that for the rest of my life, I would be happy and I, w- I could do it. I know that I, I want to do that. So I got to tell Scott that, which is a pretty cool little fact too, before he passed. And um, once I got hooked, uh, you know, I started playing guitar all the time and trying to figure out my voice with an accompanying instrument. So I wouldn't say the guitars were my first love. Uh, a piano is what I first started on when I was nine, but I used these instruments for songwriting and just to try to get some accompaniment and try to find my voice. While I was listening to all these lead singers and stuff like that. So I went to diving into my, my rock and roll adventure, you know, and trying to find yourself. And, and um, church was kind of one of the ways that I could actually play the guitar and and get away with it, you know? So I went, you know, and I was a worship leader for a while when I was young. But um, once I started to build a, ga- a catalog of my own songs and stuff like that, I started getting into, uh, you know, gigging out and playing and stuff like that. So that's how it all started. Amazing. And um, tell me, what was your inspirations of music too, like growing up? Growing up, um, it started with the kind of the grunge movement, you know, because or it's in rock and roll. But when I was younger, you know, my grandmother was very into Elvis and very, I would, my first records, I remember first final records were like gospel Elvis, of course, you know, something Christian of, of, the, of the Lord. Um, but the gospel music and Elvis was such a character. So I, he, I, I remember him being like one of the first people I listened to vocally. And I remember my dad really liking Michael Jackson. I remember when I was five, he would take me up and teach me dance moves and, 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 you know, I was always very, very involved in, in dancing and singing and, and plays and stuff like that when I was younger. But when I started to get into like rock and roll, um, which I really fell in love with, it, it was the grunge movement, Pearl Jam, Soundgarden, you know, Alice in Chains, um, um, you know, uh, all those sort of bands that era, STP, uh, Nirvana, of course. Uh, and then that's what kind of drew me to the guitar. And then that's when I really got into it. And when I got into them, I started going, well, who do they listen to? And then I got into the Stones and the Beatles and the Who and, and you know, Jimi Hendrix and all those people that they were getting their influences. That led up and of course, the greats. And then I was like, well, who did those guys listen to? And then I went even back deeper in the, the, the jazz era or blues era, Cal Calloway or, you know, Muddy Waters, Albert King, all the Kings, you know, Freddie King. All that kind of stuff. And then I went deeper, deeper, deeper to see where the roots of this thing came from. And that was kind of like my musical journey. And then I started just playing the blues and trying to figure out why is this thing so simple to play, but so hard, you know? And then you know, I realized it's all about soul and emotion and, and really diving deep and believing 
and what you're singing and understanding it. And so that's kind of how I, I, I did it. It took me on this journey. And then you find yourself through all these different people. You just kind of grab little bits of things that you like or things that really, you know, relate to you. And you kind of add it to your repertoire of, of singing and try to mesh it all together so you don't copy anybody too much. You know, you don't want to be a, that. You want to be your own. And um, so hopefully I'm doing that. And then that's that's kind of how I did it. Yeah, that's um, really great. It sounds like you're definitely uh, open-minded too. So it's really like, you know, listening to all these kind of different genres and, you know, great artists. Yeah. It's obviously opened your mind to um, be on another level. So, yeah, it's incredible. Absolutely. It's all about the combination of something and something new. And I think that's something that is very, very important, especially in rock and roll. You don't want a copycat of something. You don't want something that's already been done. You want something new. You want it your way, how you view it. So I, I, I encourage young of musicians, anybody starting out, or even musicians of my predecessors or whatever, contemporaries, uh, you know, beat you. And that's and that's a hard thing to find, um, but uh, you can do it. And then if you do it with enough research and play enough, you know, and you give it all, you, you start to find yourself. What's the best advice you would give a young musician coming up? I, I was asked this question before. Um, and it's kind of a cliche thing to say, but it's the never give up sort of thing. Um, you're always going to find something through failure. You're always going to find something when it, times are tough. So um, that's really where you, where you what makes breaks you. You're not really the good times. So, you know, when you're, when you're paycheck to paycheck even, or it's a money thing, or if it's a writer's block thing, all of these things are coming to this, this head and, and your song and your message. And then maybe an event with it within it. So as a songwriter, as a musician, as a singer, frustration is going to come and all that kind of stuff is going to come and obstacles are going to come. But just love it and do not give up. And you will find what you're looking for. It really comes to you rather you go into it. So um, that is, I know, something that a lot of people say, but it is very true. And then if you don't, you really do create something magical. You find, And also you find about yourself, whether it's even musical or not you find out who you are and what you're made of and if you really love music and if music can help you guide you through that that part of your life. And then hopefully it can help someone else through a part of their life because you went through it. So that's the, you know, that's the universal thing that happens. If I can relate it to something that happened to me and then someone else can help grab hold to it, you know, that's the beauty in it. That's really, really good advice. What's the best advice you've received? Uh, um, here's the, where you sing the best. <laughs> I was in the studio with Buck Johnson. <laughs> You're right here more than here. I'm like, oh, okay. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I think the best ad advice, um, I think maybe the best advice is the best criticisms I've gotten at, at certain times. Things that people have said that I didn't like hearing. And, and whether I, I taking them and altering it or not altering it to, to fit who I was. I think that some of the things that, you know, when, when you really don't have a good gig, how do you have a good, a better gig next time? You know, and, and I remember certain people comparing me to a lot of different people when I was on the strip and, uh, you know, to Jim Morrison's and, and, and Mick Jagger's and stuff like that. And I remember going, I don't want to completely be like that. I want to be someone new. So. The, some of the best advice I've give, been given has been kind of things that were not advice, but were things that were happening that I didn't, I, I really didn't want to happen. So to alter it and then try to figure out who I was was really important to me. So, um, yeah, so sometimes criticism is the best advice, you know, if you could take it like that and know that, hey, I'm in this all the way. I'm not giving up. I'm not getting out of it. I'm just becoming who I'm really becoming, you know. Yeah, marvelous song. Yeah, that's great. Um, what are you planning on doing any tours? I I hope so. I really do. We were talking about this actually on another interview as well. Um, uh, it's hard getting those guys all together <laughs> that I just played with, and I really want that band, of course. Um, I think that uh, I could definitely get these guys back into a room to do a big performance, maybe on TV or a festival or some sort of huge performance. And um, but I have an, another kind of side band that I just was out in LA uh, playing with that are full of just is really really good young younger musicians, but coming uh, up and coming and 
I have a little group that if I need to go tour and, and get this music out there, I can do that. So um, right now we're just really trying to push the record and see what tours are really out there that we want, you know, I've, you know, I'm shooting for the big ones, you know, and <laughs> which is getting in front of some really, really big people and, 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 and hopefully that can happen. So right now it's more about just trying to get, the, you know, get the, having the band agree to it, seeing what the availability is, pushing the record, getting it, taking this year and getting it out there and then see what kind of comes our way because we're getting more opportunity, the more people hear it. And, um, but you know, my, my heart is in live music, so I can't wait to get back on stage and, and do that as many nights as I can. But it's more about just kind of getting the music out there so people can hear it and then, and then hopefully getting on the right tour for us to, you know, it, it, get it out to the most people. Wonderful. All right, tell me, kill me to keep loving you. Tell me about the song. What, what actually it represents, what it means. Um, if somebody was listening to it and you listen to what, what, why would that resonate with them? Well, we kind of chose it because we thought it would resonate a, a very well with people. We thought it was very relatable to everybody, I think, in a certain degree, if you're in, you know, if lived life, you know, and, and gotten your heart broken or gone through certain, certain things, has been in a situation where it, something may, might have been too hard, but had to, it had to go, you know, or something that you really love that had to kind of, you know, dissipate and, you, and it's hard to get out of. But if you don't get out of it, you're going to lose yourself within it. So it's kind of like that's where the, what the song was for me. And I was getting out of, you know, something. And, and, and it could be anything, whether it's a relationship or uh, it could be an addiction. It could be it could be something that is just hurting you and, and it's not right for you anymore. But you'd still love it. And it was a part of you. So hopefully the song is going to help people make that choice or not make that choice. Maybe just relate with something like that, you know. Because there are things out there that are, that can do that, and so I think that's where the relatability for me. I was like, "Wow, this makes sense to me." When I heard it, it was a demo that uh, Buck Johnson did. He wrote it and um, he sent it to me, and I'm I'm I love writing my own material, so I'm really kind of I'm not so much uh, into like singing other people's songs, but when he hit it, when he gave it to me, I was just like, "Ah, oh, I guess I have to do it." And he wrote it for somebody in particular that he thought that I was you know comparable to, and I could really kill it and 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 uh so i was like okay let's give it a go and once we did it and once i sang it it was like whoa okay this is this is me i can make this my own and it did have like a more of a pop country feel when i first heard it so i was like ah i'm not really into that but once you get rich fortis on it and you get my vo vocals and you get billy sheehan and kenny and and tommy on it it becomes a big rock ballad you know it becomes this bigger thing that i couldn't see so the relatability was there for me. And then all of a sudden, to make it sound that large was, wow, oh my goodness, okay. I know what you guys were doing. You know, they know, those guys just know what they're doing so well. And uh, it was it was hard to trust them at certain times because you are used to doing a certain thing. But who else are you going to trust but the best in the world? So I was kind of outnumbered. <laughs> it was like, just listen, you know, just listen to what these guys have to say. And boy, did it work. What is um? If you can share briefly, what is some of the advice they've given you or that really stands out for you during that process? Um, I think we, we would always have like kind of a time together where we'd have after our work was done, you know, some bottles of wine would come out or something like that. And it would be chill time. And then just listen to some of the stories that they've had um, was uh, was amazing advice, which I, I can't I'll, I'll repeat all of them. But it was so crazy how much experience that they had. And one of the things that didn't really give me much advice, but more encouragement, you know, it was more like, listen, you can do this. We believe in you. And it was, wow, for someone of that status to, to say those sort of things, you start to really believe it. And, and it was more of like, not about teaching me. It was leading by example and how they would just go into the studio and, and be there hours before everybody, before me, warmed up, uh, ready to go. A rehearse all day, 12 hours, right? I was, however long it took. It was just the work ethic I was amazed by. I thought I was hardworking, but I was like, when you get five of those guys in there, you understand why they are where they are and how much they really just enjoy it. It's not work to them. They don't feel like they're working. They just feel like, oh my goodness, I have to play music. It's, they still do. They still act like that. And that's like, wow, uh, if I can end up like that, you know, 
I'm going to be okay. So it was more just more just a, a lead by example sort of thing. You know, I can't really specifically say certain yeah. things. It's just like, wow, look at these guys enjoying what they love to do. Still at this age, they've been around the world, uh, you know, 50 times over and some of them. And, and that is, that is what I want. You know, that is the life that I want. And, and, and it felt like I was having it in, in that moment. So. Well, I believe you're going to get it. You're definitely on the trajectory. <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> um, what, what are your um, passions and hobbies aside from music? What, uh, what, what, what do you like personally? Well, when I was younger, there wasn't much. It was all music, you know? It was music and, and running around amok on the Sunset Strip and playing and doing all that. But uh, recently, I've kind of gotten into... Um, Make, making sure I keep myself in shape and stuff like that. I actually just took up goth the other, the, this summer. My dad's like a kind of a scratch gopher. And, um, I kind of got into goth, um, with him because he's so good. And I, and it was a good time, a good thing to spend with your father, you know, out yeah. in the golf course, doing your thing. And I started to get good at it. So I kind of got into it. I got a lot of golf balls for Christmas. So, <laughs> so that was, um, but, uh, I kind of it, doing that and trying to, you know, um, I'm very, very into kind of movies into and, and, and certain things like that. Anything that inspires me to get into my songwriting, anything that I can, um, gravitate towards or, or, or grab from, from, from my environment, I'm really into to write and, and do it the healthy way. Now, I always have to do it the rock and roll way, you know, go lose your mind and go get in a bad relationship or do this and do that. There's all sorts of ways of, uh, and there's sort of songs just there if you, if you're looking for it, you know, sort of thing. So. So I've been doing some of that. I've been, you know, working out and getting ready for tour, you know, that kind of stuff. When tour calls, I'm going to be ready. So, but most of my life, to be honest with you, has always been about music. And, and uh, there's nothing wrong w- with that for me. You know, I, and music has always been my number one love and she's always been there for me. And, um, but, um, it, but, it, you know, that, that sort of thing, you know, just getting ready for the big show. You know, that's what I'm, I'm waiting for. Incredible. All right. Tell me. If you were 18 again, and if you change anything in your life, what would you change? It can be personally or professionally. Hmm. Ooh, what would I change? Um, I don't know. I I don't have that many things that I would change. I would take care of myself a little bit better. That's so always I'm. A, I've been getting into that sort of realm. Um, health. You know, making sure that I'm ready and able to take on. I've been through a lot of different things throughout my life, you know, it's just to get to the point where you can really enjoy it and you want to enjoy it at this point. So, um, um, really trying to get healthy and, and in mind and, and centeredness and enjoy it without having have to alter your reality at all. When you get to have your dream, you want to experience it full force. So that, that is one thing that I've been, um, working on. And I'm not saying that I'm a, a bad health. I'm good health. I just want to really. Um, uh, be the best that I can be, you know. Yeah, that's great. All right. Um, your end game obviously is to go to the next level and be highly successful. Where do you see yourself in ten years' time? Ooh, I see myself on a stage somewhere, <laughs> or right, mm-hmm. making another record with those guys, or right. or, or some like them. You know, uh, I really do. I, I'm I'm in for the long haul. I always have been. I made that decision when I picked up a guitar, or when I was very very young that. This was going to take everything I had and, and never saying, uh, all right, now I'm going to take a break, you know, and I was going to go for it. And it was kind of like, you know, in that mentality at that time, it was like, I'm going to die for this. But now it's kind of like, now I want to live for it. You know, it was, it's weird when you switch over. It's like, now I'm living for rock and roll instead of dying for it. And so that is, um, that is where I see myself. I see myself, uh, a better singer, a better guitar player, a better songwriter. I see myself maybe writing for certain people that would be very cool. Maybe getting into production, maybe helping younger bands that are maybe get inspired by maybe another, a new rock and roll kind of revolution sort of thing and helping them kind of get their feet on the ground and get more good music out there. I really believe in that a movement or anything like a, a regenerate uh, sort of thing like rock and roll needs a bunch of different bands to do it, just like the Seattle movement or something like that, you know? So we need a bunch of people writing really good, putting everything into it, and 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 most importantly, being real and putting their soul into it. So, um, if I could help out anybody in that sort of way, whether they're inspired or I could do it personally, I would love that. So, I see that in ten years, I see the world 
be in a, hopefully a different place with a lot more um, um, mu good music in it, and and also uh, more guitars in in music, <laughs> not such not so pro produced and and technical and and more soul, you know. So that's where I, I see more soul in ten years, you know. Terrific, terrific. All right, uh, Brett, thanks for on the podcast. I do appreciate it. Um, Absolutely, it's really amazing. Yeah. Um, uh, thank you so much, Nick. And by the way, I love your stuff. I checked it out, and uh, you keep doing what you do. I really, really, I'm, I'm impressed by you and everything you're doing so thank you so much for having me on oh well, not as much as i'm impressed by you so there we go <laughs> romance is a love there we go, brother. <laughs> all right you have fun are you in sydney right now by the way Just yeah i am i am it's 9 30 in the morning here. oh my goodness it's early well you have a great day and everything and thank you so much again okay yeah happy new year's too happy new year's mm.